Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for the invitation, Hanan. The previous talks were great. So I'm at uh, Tel Aviv University. I'm, uh, my training is mainly neuroscience, a bit of economics. The fields of my study are neuroeconomics and what we call consumer neuroscience. And I was asked today to talk about mainly one branch of our, my studies in the lab, which are basically are using EG data or neural data in order to try to predict what you will choose in the future, what are your preferences, whether you like some product or not. Now this is the more applied part of my uh, studies and I will give you some examples of what we can do with this, uh, uh, with this tool and what is the idea behind it, why do we, we even uh, bother to use the brain in order to predict uh, choices. So um, think about that in marketing research, usually what we want to do is we want to know whether a product will be uh, successful, which uh, commercial to work with. And usually what happens is that the standard way of, of research is either giving people questionnaires or focus groups and uh, uh, things like that, which are known to have many, many biases. That is the main, main problem. And this is why a lot of marketing campaigns are unsuccessful. People invest a lot of money in it, but they are unsuccessful. And the idea is that it is one of the reasons, not just because the product is not good, but it could be that the product is very good, but the campaign was not good enough because the measurements that were used are full of biases. For example, when uh, I give people to, uh, answer questionnaires, in many cases they will, for example, will not say what they truly believe or, or, or they don't even know exactly what they're going to choose in the future and they make up some uh, questions. There are many, many biases. Example, in focus groups, usually it will be like a dominant person who will say what they think and the other people will just nod with their head, yes, okay, but it's not really what they think or they're embarrassed to tell that they vote voted for Trump or they uh, like guns or stuff like that, but it actually, uh, they will not be implemented in, their, in the real choices. So uh, what we think is that we can overcome some of these biases, of course not all of them, uh, that we could use different measurements, that we could uh, overcome these biases, but also get uh, 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 some measurement of, of uh, unconscious information that questionnaires or, or focus group are not even, I cannot even uh, induce in the subjects. Um, and the tool to do that is to use neural and physiological data. I'm going to present you data today just with neural data, but physiological data could be either heart rate, eye movements, skin conductance, etc. anything that I can measure from the body that could help me uh, it, to gain additional measurement to the standard way that marketing is doing their uh, um, research. Now importantly, the, go the goal is not to replace standard measures. If we could harness what Ori just showed you with a beautiful uh, uh, model, that will be the baseline. Okay, we'll use everything that we can have from questionnaires and behavioral data. But the idea is to add an additional layer that hopefully will gain us better prediction than the standard way of people are doing research in marketing research in most cases. Okay, so the idea is to better predict uh, preferences and campaigns, etc. Now I'll show you just a brief short uh, um, example. This is, uh, it was uh, in, in some TV program, but it's just an example of how marketing research in, ma in many cases are done. This is, you'll see a woman looking in, with, uh, on, with two boxes of, of milk and she's asked like, two questions which look simple enough, but I think the day, like her answer is like weird. She, she doesn't even know what actually uh, to say, so it's a very short one, but it will emphasize what's the main problem as I see it in marketing research. <laughs> So um, I don't know if it's like it's these weird questions. I don't know what Israeliut means. 
What is uh, mishpachtiyut? It's like everybody has its own definition for that. It's very, very, very noisy. So, and, and this is like standard marketing research, and the idea is maybe we can add some information above and beyond those uh, standard measures. Oh, okay. So, um, I'm summarizing hundreds of, of studies. Some came from my lab, some came from other labs in the, in, in the world. We came to a conclusion that there are several brain areas that if we look at their activity, it could tell us something about the value that people put on options. It doesn't matter which, uh, which what's, what are the names of these areas, but just, this is the front of the brain, this is the back, this is where it, it's connected to, the, to, your, uh, to your spinal cord. But these two main regions are active in any choice situation that was ever measured inside a brain scan. That means that it doesn't matter if it, you made choices for money or for food or uh, drinks or finding sexual uh, partners or investing in stocks or negotiations, anything that was ever tested, these brain areas coded your valuation. That means if you preferred an option better, the brain activity in these areas was higher. And it, that means uh, it's these areas what are called the common currency network. They're not the only areas, but they're the main areas that they are coding how much you want something. So that's basic science, it's interesting, we wrote papers. The question is what can we do with that? The idea is that we, we, we uh, can maybe measure values in the brain directly without even ask you, asking you anything and we, can act, and we can look for each of the subjects at their brain activity and rank the preferences of their choices, or goods or, or uh, commercials, whatever, whatever we give them uh, um, just by looking at their uh, brain activity. And maybe by using that, we can make better predictions and even predict a subject's future choices based on their brain data that we measure right now. Just to give you a concrete example, this is time, this is, uh, let's consider this is my brain and it's the, my, my brain activity. And if I'll, uh, uh, I'll look at uh, this uh, glass of water, I'll have some brain activity as a response to that uh, glass of water. Uh, and for orange juice, a bit, I like it a bit better, so the brain activity will be higher. For Coke, it will be higher. For a glass of wine, it's not bad. And I like very much beer, so uh, th this is how my brain activity will look like. That means I can just look at these brain activations and try to predict, based on them, the rank ordering of my preference here without asking me anything just by looking at specific brain regions um, in the in, uh, specific brain, the signal in the specific brain regions. Now this has already been done. I'm just going to show you some examples. One of the first papers did, did this inside the, you know, the scanner at NYU and they gave subjects to sit inside the fMRI scanner. Um, by the way, if you don't know, fMRI scanner is a standard MRI scanner you have in the hospital that uh, I don't know if somebody already was scanned by an MRI. It's the same thing, it's a huge magnet. The only difference to make it uh, fMRI, it means that I can measure your blood uh, 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 in, in the brain areas and we assume that a brain area that is more activated will attract more, attract more blood. That means I assume that the brain area is activated. So they sat there inside the fMRI scanner and they saw all kinds of, uh, sorry, all kind of goods, could be CDs. This was way back in 2011. And they just sat there and they were asked to think how much you value something. Just, and, look, and, we, and they looked at the brain activity. Later on, half, uh, uh, half an hour later, outside the scanner, without brain data at all, they had to choose between all the possible pairs. What do you prefer, this or that, whatever. They had 20 different goods. So for each of the individual subjects, they had a rank ordered preferences of all their possibilities. And then later on, they could decode, look at the brain data from the valuation areas, and they were able to predict what the individual subjects would choose 30 minutes later, just based on the brain data from the previous, uh, from the first phase. That was the first real experiment that actually used brain data in order to predict um, choices, actually future choices. Now this was done later on with other stuff like predicting whether I like or not cars. Um, this was done also to predict the success of songs 
the, re uh, the real success of song in the world by just uh, uh, scanning 40 subjects, giving them to, to listen to short clips uh, from, the, from the songs, measure their brain activity, and then by using this focus, basically what we call neurofocus group, in order to predict their, uh, the success of the real songs in the, in the population. This was already also done for anti-campaign, um, anti-smoking, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, also for crowdfunding, people saw in the scanner some information about a possible project, measured their brain activity, and then it was, they were able to predict which of the project will eventually be funded, which was not. And these are all interesting examples of how we can use fMRI in order to predict all kinds of valuation processes and future success of things that marketing, uh, marketers and business people care about. Now there is a, a small problem with all these studies for application. Who knows how much an MRI scanner costs? About three to four million dollars depends on the, on the uh, uh, machine. You have to build a big room with concrete walls for about 40, uh, 50 centimeters uh, thick. It's a big, big operation. It costs each year also to cool it. You have special uh, people. So it's not really, really applicable for every, maybe Playtica can buy an FMRI if they want, but smaller businesses, maybe not. So what we thought is say, okay, let's try to use this same idea, but to use a simpler system in order to predict uh, um, marketing success or subjects future choices. So luckily there is a system, there is a machine that's already been around for a hundred years in standard research in academia and it's called EEG. So the short is for e e electroencephalogram. It's a machine that writes electrical brain signals and it looks like this. This is, These are uh, many many electrodes that are stuck to your scalp and it just measures the average brain activity from many, many, many uh, uh, neurons. Now this is a, a, a fancy system that costs, the most expensive one would cost around $50,000, which is not a big deal. But nowadays there are actually what I call toys, which have one electrode, two electrodes, maybe four to eight, which are very, very cheap. They're mobile. You can use them anywhere you want. People use them uh, in the supermarket, in cars, in planes, whatever you want. You can put a, a, a toy e.g. and measure some uh, brain activities. So it, it is a lot more applicable than, than using fMRI. So the, game, the goal was to use this old uh, machine in order to predict actual marketing uh, uh, success and, and subjects uh, choices. So we, what we did is we said let's do the simple experiment but now instead of fMRI let's use EEG and this is exactly what we did. We gave subject to look at products like product like these all kinds of standard products and we ask them just think how much something is worth to you without doing anything no behavior nothing at all and then on the uh, following phase without EEG they had to choose the binary choices what do you prefer this or that we rank order them and then by looking and decoding uh, the EEG uh, data we were able to separate between the preferred option and to the non-preferred option, which the, the choices were around 20 minutes after this uh, first stage. Now, I don't know if you uh, ask yourself or not, but how good can we predict? Not just the EG, all the fMRI experiments before us, how good can we predict? Well, remember that when we want to predict binary choices, chance is 50%. I don't need anything. Just flip a coin, I'm 50%. So, uh, uh, we looked at all the studies and the accuracy is ranging between 60 to 80 percent. 80 percent is pretty good. If you tell a marketer that you can predict whether uh, a commercial A or commercial B would be better, it's worth a lot of money, 60 percent is, is not bad but not great. So we want to, to understand why sometimes it's 80 percent and sometimes it's 60 percent. So what we did to our data, look at this x-axis, it's actually looking at the neural, what we call the neural distance. Look, uh, think about the activity between two products and how different they are in their preferences. 
Number nine is when two products are very, very different in the preferences for a given subject, while uh, product uh, like neural distance one is that the products are very close. So if you notice, when the products and the preferences are very close, the neural data is very similar and we cannot predict anything. We're at chance level. We can only predict very well when the distance is very, very far, which makes sense, but, but that's also a caveat in all these uh, methods. We have to take this into consideration. We cannot read your mind. It's very hard to predict uh, when the things are very, very close to each other. And this is exactly what marketers want. They want to know whether I need to go with the brand or the package with a uh, slight different red between the packages. Very, very slight differences. Nowadays, uh, I want to blow a bubble here. The neuroscience methods that we have cannot differentiate when the, uh, when the options are very, very close to each other. I don't know what you read in the books, but that's just false. It's very hard. We need to have them very, very separate in order to do something uh, uh, meaningful. Okay. Um, and then later on, other studies came and were able to show that we can predict uh, Super Bowl commercials and success in movie trailers uh, based on uh, p people watched movie trailers and then they looked in real, uh, real life sales uh, and also uh, there was a study that measured EEG inside the cinema while people watched movies and they uh, were able to predict their success in general. But what we, I did not show you yet is something that is very, very important is whether all these fancy stuff, whether they can do better than, or not better, but whether they can add some information to the standard measures. If I can just give people some you know, questionnaire, what do you prefer, commercial A or B, I'm done, I don't need anything. Or if I can just use behavioral measures to use prediction, I don't need the fancy brain. It's nice to write papers about it. It has big, uh, nice pictures, but it's not useful. So the challenge is whether we can use something with the brain to, over, uh, to show prediction over and above the standard measures. So this is uh, uh, what this study is about. It uh, was done by my uh, wonderful PhD student, Adam Hakim. And then we uh, did a very simple uh, experiment where we gave people a series of, um, if you remember the Sidra um, Ktsarim, so they saw this short uh, movie clips by Ktsarim, and then some commercials, and then Ktsarim commercials for a half an hour. We wanted to show them like a real TV, you know, a half an hour in front of the TV. And during this phase, we measured their EEG. There were six different commercials, repeated several times, doesn't matter the details. What's important is that after the EEG session, we also gave them a standard marketing questionnaire that is done in the industry. If a, a, a fancy marketing uh, uh, um, company wants to evaluate these commercials, they will give people this questionnaire, how much did you like it, where, where are they gonna buy it, do you remember it, blah, 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 all kinds of questionnaires. What this gives us, it gives us a baseline of how good the, you know, the standard uh, marketing questionnaires are doing. And then at final stage, each of the products that they saw in this commercial, they made binary choices, so for each of the subject we can rank order all their uh, uh, preferences. So that was number two. So we have the EG data, we have their baseline questionnaire, and we have their preferences based on their binary choices. What the next thing that we did is we took data from YouTube actually, because these were uh, commercials that were already out there, and we got some metrics of the YouTube success. How, much, how many views, shares, likes, blah, 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 etc. that gave for each of the, um, of the commercials how much they were uh, successful in, uh, in the real market, in the population. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to use this, the EEG in order to predict their choices, but also to predict marketing uh, YouTube success and Importantly, what we had to show in order to make this all viable is that we can do better than what the questionnaires are doing. Um, so I'm not going, going to go over all the results, but to make a, a long story short, the questionnaires were doing not bad. The, pre, the prediction was pretty good. 
What we were able to show using various uh, machine learning methods, which I don't, I don't have time to get into the details, it doesn't matter, these are four different uh, um, measurements, that by adding the EEG information, the EEG features, we were able to, pr to increase the prediction rate compared to the, the questionnaires. This means that there, are, there is some information in the neural data that is not in the questionnaires. So we were very happy in that. And last, here in this study, we were also uh, able to show is that we were able to predict the real marketing success as measured by YouTube based on the same features of the EEG data, which, were, which means that it's not just, uh, we can use these features not just to predict the, the in-group choices uh, of these guys who, who, me who measured their brain, but if the, the group is representative to the population, we can actually say something about the prediction of the population. Now, uh, the last thing is this is a very brand new uh, project. We said, okay, let's use, instead of using machine learning to decode the information, let's use some deep uh, learning uh, models. This is fancy now, so let's, why not, let's do that. I'm, not, I'm joking, but the, the main idea to use deep learning, not just because it's uh, successful, it's because all the, the previous uh, uh, models that we used, even in machine learning, we have to choose the features. We have to input, like what uh, Ori said, we have to give the, the model the, the features. Now in EEG, there are endless features, po endless possible features. When you do pre-processing of EEG data, even before you start the analysis, some people calculated, you have more than 10,000 possibilities that the subjects need, the, sorry, that the experiment need to choose in order to say, okay, I'm going with these features and not these, I'm cleaning the data like this and not. So this gives, you know, it's an endless problem and it could cause a lot of biases. And in the deep learning, we can just, we throw in the raw data. We're not putting any features. We're letting the system uh, do its thing and, uh, and let it predict now, I'm not going to go uh, into the details, but it was a simple uh, experiment. Subject saw a, uh, a product, and three seconds later, it, it had to, to, uh, to state their willingness to pay. How much do you want to buy this product? $2, $7, $15, whatever. And we want to use the EEG data from here to predict this part. There were various different goods, different goods types, uh, about 80 different uh, uh, products. Um, so I'm not going to go into the network, but this is one, just one uh, piece of the convolutional neural network, which this is instead of doing the pre-processing and filtering by hand. You want the system to decode all the, f the different features, uh, frequencies, clean the data, all that, by using these convolutional uh, networks. What you saw here is one one here, you have, we had many of these. We had a part which is also important to try to decode or to take into account, because this is a time series, to take into account dependencies between the points and to take into account dependencies between trials. Think about in a game that uh, and each time you play the game there is uh, um, dependencies. This also takes that into account. And this is preliminary data, but we have some uh, pretty nice uh, uh, predictions uh, using the deep learning. We're very excited. What's nice about this is you can later on go back and try to decode these features that the deep learning chose. And I, you're not familiar with EEG data, but this is not EEG data that we did the pre-processing. These are outputs of the deep learning network that can actually now go, we can go back and get insights of what are the real features that were beneficial it could help us in order uh, to predict. Uh, so that's it. I just want to uh, summarize. I think there is information in neural data in order to predict various things, but it's not to replace standard and behavioral models and data science and all that. It's just we think we can add an additional prediction success or prediction rate above and beyond whatever other people are doing. So that's it. Thanks.